Everything changed with the passing of the Old Covenant, the death and the resurrection of Christ, the sending down of the Holy Ghost at Pentecost, and the establishment of the New Covenant. Specifically, as it pertains to the discussion at hand, that means how values are defined, the nature of God's blessing, how warfare is identified, and how we regard the kingdom, the temple of God, the holy city, and the people of God. The first half of Daniel's 70th week took place under the Old Covenant as the Messiah Prince came and confirmed the Old Covenant to the Jews. But three and one half years into that week, the Messiah Prince was cut off. He made the house of Israel desolate because of their abomination in crucifying the Lord of glory, and he took the kingdom from them and gave it to the church. Now we are looking at the last half of Daniel's 70th week. This is a necessary exercise because of the importance of Daniel's prophecy about the Messiah and his earthly ministry in the Gospels. And it is important because of the humanistic, disorderly, counter-gospel of Christian Zionism as it pertains to the kingdom of God on earth and Zionism's attempt to rob the earthly ministry of Christ of its meaning with respect to the Daniel 9:24 to 27 passage. Before passing on, we will take the time to show how this last half of the 70th week of Daniel is identified, where and when it exists, and wherein it consists. Is there anything left in God's program to be accomplished in this world that is not comprehended in the last half of the week? What does the Bible say about it? That is what we shall see. Now this is not an attempt to jump ahead and to preempt future subjects in this harmony of the Gospels. It is rather an effort to correctly identify the prophetic significance of Christ showing to Israel at his baptism on his 30th birthday and the complete and final nature of his accomplishments on this his first and only visit to this present earth as a Jew and a man after the flesh. A correct understanding of the meaning of the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John depend on correct doctrine being established in this matter. It is the more important in our age of reason and age of enlightenment era when the historic orthodox theology of the church, which prevailed virtually unchallenged for more than 1800 years, has been perverted and distorted by materialistic theology in the 19th and 20th and now the 21st centuries. In other words, this is not a preempting of future studies of the Gospels. It is the laying of the proper biblical foundation for it upon which all correct doctrine and theology must be structured. Well, let's continue a bit with how this last half of the program of the Messiah Prince in this world is described and identified. Revelation 11.2 says, But the court which is without the temple leave out and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. 42, as we indicated earlier in our comments on Matthew 117, is a significant symbolic number in that it represents half of seven years. That is exactly the point if it is rightly understood. The time of the Gentiles, which is from Pentecost to the end of the world, is here described symbolically as 42 months, which is three and a half years, and is the last three and a half years of Daniel's 70th week. Revelation 12:14 says, And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place, where she is nourished for a time, times and half a time, from the face of the serpent. 
In this passage, the era of the woman who is the church is described as times, time, and half a time. I am sure that you have already figured out that this is three and one half and is again a symbolic way of describing the last three and a half years of Daniel's 70th week. The mission of the church and her time in this world is described in Revelation 11 and verses 3 and 4 in this way. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days, clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. Two is the number of witness and is describing the mission of the church. Why the number two? Well, there are several possibilities. It may be describing the union between Christ and the church in the enterprise of the mission. Or it may be identifying the church in league with and under the power and influence of the Holy Ghost. And then some orthodox theological thinkers believe that it was describing the combined efforts of the children of promise in the plan of redemption under both covenants. There were children of promise under the old covenant. But whatever God's motive behind it, too, is the number of witness. Now, we could go into an extended discussion of that, but we will not at this time. Well, you can track it down if you want. I have a 1,500-page commentary on the book of Revelation dealing with every verse and symbol called Seven Trumpets of Sounding that you can download from our website for a very nominal fee. In it, I have gone fully into such things, but now is not the time. The olive trees are a type of the Holy Ghost, the oil of the Spirit, and is describing the source from which the church gets her power and the source of oil for her lamps. The candlestick is Christ, the light of the world. The light of the world is currently shining through the church, the city set on the hill. Thus, in this passage, there are two candlesticks, Christ and his church. I am sure that you have figured out that 8,203 score days is three and a half years and is yet another metaphorical way using the symbolic property of numbers to identify the last half of Daniel's week. But maybe Revelation is not using symbolism. Maybe the things in it are to be taken only literally. Well, of all the silly arguments that have been put forth by materialistic theology, this one takes the prize. Is Christ's belly literally made of ivory? Are his feet literally made of brass? Is his hair literally wool? Are his eyes literally on fire? Does he literally have a sword sticking out of his mouth? Is God literally a trumpet? Is Christ literally a sheep? Is the great whore literally an enormous fat woman so large that it takes a literal seven mountains for her to sit down on? Is Babylon literally a harlot in a red dress? Is Christ literally going to throw the leaders of compromised churches into a bed with a seductress named Jezebel? Well, of course, the way some of these premillennial gurus have been behaving morally, they're probably turned on at the prospect. But cool down, boys. It isn't going to happen. It's only symbolism. And believe me, on and on and on and on it goes. I was raised in a theological environment where men claimed to take revelation literally and poke sticks at all those who did not. But none of them kept his own rule because obviously he could not. And if you're one that believes that the images and numbers of revelation are only to be taken literally, neither can you. That is not an argument. It's a simple statement of fact. When you're alone someday and feeling particularly honest with no one around to see or hear, 
Try it sometime. Get serious for a moment, will you? This is a claim so ridiculous that it hardly dignifies rebuttal. But maybe only images are symbolic in Revelation. Maybe numbers are literal with no symbolic properties or qualities. Well, all right, let's think about that for a moment. Are there seven Holy Spirits? Does Christ literally have seven horns sticking out of his head? Does he literally have seven eyes spaced in a circle around his head? Were there literally only seven churches in existence in Asia Minor in the days of St. John? Are there literally seven angels who received all the instruction for the church and passed it on? Are there going to be seven literal trumpets sounding in all the earth? If you do not understand that seven is the symbolic number that represents a complete and perfect operation of God, then you are not close to the meaning of the Bible on this. Well, let's go on a bit with numbers and symbols. Was the church at Smyrna only going to have tribulation for a literal ten days? Are there actually a hapless gaggle of religious dupes standing in line outside the harlot's temple down in Babylon waiting to get in to see a literal ten-headed dragon, a literal seven-headed beast, a literal false prophet that literally looked like a two-headed lamb with no eyes, and a literal three frogs in the performance of over the river and through the woods to the fat woman's house we go. As St. Paul pleaded with the intellectuals in Corinth in a related issue, in malice be children, but in understanding be men. It is recommended to be childlike in your faith and commitment to God and to be simple in your wholesome and pure attitude toward Christ and the church. You do not have to be smart to be a good Christian but you do have to study to rightly divide the word of truth. It is not recommended to be adolescent and childlike in your understanding of the scriptures. My friends, it's time to grow up. As the apostle instructed those same Corinthians in the second chapter of his first letter, stop comparing spiritual things with carnal and natural and start comparing them with spiritual the book of Revelation is a book of symbols. The book of Revelation is a book of symbols. And the 42 months, the times, time and half a times, the 1260 days, all symbolically, prophetically, metaphorically, allegorically, and or idiomatically identify the last half of Daniel's 70th week, which is the church age. But doesn't the Bible say that there are another 1,007 years to follow the return of Christ and that the 70th week of Daniel takes place then? Well, in the first place, the 70th week would not have begun 484 years after the commandment to restore and to rebuild Jerusalem, would it? So the literalists are contradicting themselves right there. And, if that were the case, the entire earthly coming and ministry of the Messiah Prince, Christ, the King of the Jews, would have been left out of the Daniel 9.24-27 prophecy. That would mean that all the prophecies that Christ fulfilled when he came the first time, according to the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, would be in error. Well, that is what it would have to mean. Since the Messiah Prince, according to the premillennial interpretation of Daniel 9, 24, 27, is not talking about Christ's first coming. According to premillennialism and all other forms of Zionism and materialistic theology, the Messiah Prince in Daniel 9, 24 would not come until after the church age is over. Surely you do not believe that, do you? But in any case, a more direct answer to the question is no. The Bible does not say 
anywhere at any time that there is another 1,007 years in this old creation to follow after Christ's return. And since this is essential to the understanding of Daniel 9.27, and since it is directly related to Christ showing to Israel as their king in his earthly ministry in the Gospels, I will take the time to tell you what the Bible does say about that. In order to answer this question, there are a number of scriptures I want to bring up and discuss as briefly as I can and still be understood. The first is in Acts chapter 2 and verse 17. You may want to read that over carefully with our subject in mind. Do not take it to anyone else just now. Read it over and over. Pray for wisdom and see how honest you can be about what you personally think it says. We will start next time by looking into it and other scriptures if the Lord wills. But there isn't time to do that today. Read more at GodsPointOfView.com. A copy of this book is available from Amazon in Kindle and paperback format. Link in the description.